As you may know, this is Family Worship Sunday, which means it's a fifth Sunday of a month. And what we like to do on Family Sundays is uh, shut down our older kid elementary uh, ministries and invite those kids to be here with us. And what we've done the last couple years is do a, a special series that is basically just for the kids. So last year we did some questions about uh, God and faith that they had. And this year, what we decided to do is to take the, the four family Sundays that we had and look at one of the most essential Christian doctrines that there is, and that's the doctrine of the Trinity. And that might sound like, uh, you know, high flighty stuff for kids, but I think we had a good time last time. What we said last time was, if we're going to speak correctly about God, then we need to be careful of the language that we use. We need to, to um, understand what we're saying. And so the word Trinity, we said, is a combination of two words, tri, meaning three, and unity, meaning one. And so Trinity is three in one. Or you might have remembered that I said it this way, God is one what in three who's. God is one in being, but three in person which is very confusing, but we tried to walk through that last time and understand what it means. We looked at this phrase, if you remember. We said this, there is one God who eternally exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each person is equally and fully God, and yet there's only one God. One what, three who's. So as we looked at this phrase, and what we did is we took this phrase and we kind of broke it apart line by line last time, and we built out this picture. You may remember this. So this is a little diagram to help us understand the Trinity a little bit more. That God, okay, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God. And yet, the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father, right? They're distinct in personhood, yet one in essence, there is one God in three persons. So what I want to do for the remaining three family Sundays that we have during this, uh, this year is we're going to look at each of the distinct persons of the Trinity one at a time. So today we're looking at God the Father, okay? So if you have your Bible, I would invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start there. If you don't have a Bible or don't own a Bible, we do have some paperback Bibles against the walls there. You can grab one of those to follow along or you can pull up on your phone or device uh, our info hub, we call it, which is the website info.mdcashville.org. If you go to that website, you'll see a tab that says today, and you can click on the today tab, and that'll bring up the passages of scripture that we're going to be in this morning. We're going to start in Matthew chapter six. Let me pray for us before we get going, uh, and then we'll, we'll walk through Matthew six and some other passages here. Father, we do thank you for your kindness to us and the opportunity that you've given us to gather together in this room this morning as your people. Uh, I know it is crowded and, and that's an awesome thing, but it's also can be an uncomfortable thing. So help us to focus our hearts and minds on you and on your word this morning. Uh, may we celebrate as we get to uh, perform a baptism in a little while and welcome new members into our church family. We're so grateful for all that you are doing here among us and through us. And we just ask this morning as we look at what is probably a familiar a topic and doctrine to some, but, but maybe new information to others. Help us to, to hear clearly. Help me to preach clearly so that we might understand what it means for us that you, God, are our Father. So we love you and we thank you and we ask you for help in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Spirit. And everybody said, amen. So let's look at Matthew chapter six. Now, Jesus is in the middle of what's called the Sermon on the Mount and he's teaching on all kinds of things. And when we get to Matthew chapter six, uh, verse da, 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 five. Oh, I'm still in Deuteronomy. That's why it didn't look like the right thing. <laughs> Matthew five, not Deuteronomy uh, six. Matthew six, excuse me. The Lord's Prayer. Look at verse five of Matthew chapter six. Jesus says, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues on the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do, for they think that they'll be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So the first thing I want you to see here is that God is a father. 
Jesus is in this mode of teaching and he starts to teach on prayer. In Luke's gospel, Luke says that the disciples heard Jesus praying and there was something so unique and so distinct and so compelling about the way that Jesus prayed that they went to him and they said, will you teach us how to pray? And Jesus, as he begins teaching them to pray, says, and in Matthew here, he says over and over again, Father, our Father, Father. He's relating to God as a father. Now, this might not sound like a big deal to us, but you have to realize that in his time, this was absolutely revolutionary. No one related to God as father. There is only maybe one or two instances in the entire Old Testament of God's people as a whole relating to God as a a father of their nation. And one German historian looked through all records of Uh, ancient Hebrew texts and found no records whatsoever of any Jewish person relating personally to God as father until Jesus. That's a big deal. That's one of the reasons Jesus got in trouble is because uh, the Jews thought that he was being irreverent by relating to God as his father. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. He is our father. Now, uh, theologically, the son, God the son and God the spirit are equal in their godness with the Father, and yet Jesus chooses to submit himself to the Father. In other places in the Gospels, he'll say, I only do what my Father tells me to do. I only say what my, the words that I hear from my Father. He submits himself. He says, I came to do the will of the Father. So, so there's an equality, and yet Jesus submits himself to the authority of his Father. Jesus addresses God as Father more than 60 times in the New Testament, in the Gospels. He's constantly relating to God as his Father. And and so he helps us here. He says, if you've ever struggled with prayer, then don't focus on prayer, focus on your Father. Now, that may be difficult for some of us who have um, maybe not the best relationships with our dads. But this is what Jesus is saying. Prayer is about relationship. God is holy, certainly. He is sovereign, absolutely. He is the king of all kings, but he's also a dad. And prayer is about relationship with our dad, talking to our dad. Now, we have to understand, though, God's not everyone's father. God is the father of those who, by faith, come into relationship with him. John One tells us that those who have trusted in Jesus have the right to be called the children of God. And and so we are, right? Like um, I've said this before, but the neighborhood kids, like we got tons of kids in our neighborhood and none of them call me dad, right? I mean, only my kids do that. That would be weird, right? If other kids in the neighborhood came up to me and called me dad, because I'm not. I have a friend one time who was was at uh, Barnes and Noble and he was at the cafe and he was getting a coffee or something. He was sitting down. And all of a sudden, this little boy comes booking it around the corner. And he goes, Dad, can I have a brownie? And right as the word brownie came out of his mouth, he looked up and realized, that's not my dad. And so he er, just stops in mid and then turns around and runs the other direction as fast as he can. Why? Because that's not his dad. Right? You only relate to your father in that way with intimacy and with those kinds of of words. So only those who trust in Christ have the right to be called God's children. So here's what I want to do in the time that we have together. I want to just try to ask and answer, what does it mean for us that God is a father? Okay? I I don't want to get in the weeds theologically. I just want to understand for us as adults, for us as kids, like what does it mean for us that God is a father? So if you're in Matthew 6, just skip down a little bit. We're going to look at verses 25 and following. Jesus is continuing his teaching. He is just taught on prayer. He teaches on fasting. He teaches on the things that we treasure in our hearts. And then look what he says in verse 25 of chapter 6. Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? 
In which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles, that it's the pagans, they seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, what I want you to see in this section of text is that our Father provides for and protects us. Our Father provides for and protects us. You see Jesus saying, therefore, at the beginning of that text, verse 25, because he's just explained to us that God is a Father to us. And so he's saying, therefore, in light of the fact that you have a Heavenly Father, in light of the fact that you're known by Him, in light of the fact that He cares for you, and even back to verse 8, what we looked at, he says that He knows your needs, in light of the fact that you have a Father like that, therefore, do not be anxious. Three times in this text, Jesus says, don't be anxious. And it's like, thanks, Jesus. Like, nobody wants to be anxious, right? This is not like a character trait that we really want to accentuate about ourselves, right? It's not what you put on your dating profile, you know? Yes, I'm six foot three and a hundred and something pounds, and I'm full of anxiety all the time. Like, that's not an endearing quality necessarily to us, right? And yet, Jesus is saying to us, don't be anxious anxious. What is anxiety? It is being overly occupied or overly concerned with the future. If you read the text again, you'll see that, that he says, don't worry about your clothing, don't worry about your food. Uh, Down in verse 34, he says, tomorrow will worry about itself. So that's what it is. Anxiety is being overly occupied, preoccupied, overly worried about the future, about what we can't control. I love the way that Jesus handles this in verse 26, right? He says, look at the birds. You don't see birds popping anxiety pills, do you? You don't see birds worrying about where their next meal is going to come from. You don't see birds manipulating other birds to get some food from them. They don't do any of that stuff. But they eat. But they eat. They don't plant. They don't harvest, right? Birds are not out there, you know, uh, uh, on, in the farmland helping put the seeds down and watering and all that. No, they don't do any of that stuff. And yet God feeds them. He provides for them. And so Jesus says to us, don't you think you're more significant than a little bird? And I mean, we're not even talking about like a majestic bird, like an eagle or a, you know, falcon. We're talking about a crow, a little scraggly little black bird. Like they're, they're not even, they're, they're cheap. They're, they're insignificant. And yet he feeds every single one of them. Then he goes on in verse 28 and he says, hey, look at the flowers. Consider these flowers. You see these flowers working nonstop? You see these flowers putting in 80 hours a week? You see them, you know, striving and, and, and you know, making yarn and sewing it into clothes? No, none of that stuff. But who put the flowers there? God did. Who cares for them? He does. He says they're, they're, the flowers are better dressed than Solomon himself. I love that. You ever, like, they do this on I-240. Um, they, they, in the springtime, you'll see all these beautiful flowers pop up along the side of the interstate. And it's pretty, it's really pretty. And you're like, why did they put all that effort into these insignificant flowers on the side of the interstate? But, but it has this effect on us, right? They're beautiful. And, and God created all the flowers, and you know what? He didn't have to make them beautiful. But he did, because he cares. And he says, even though these flowers are here today and gone tomorrow, he makes them beautiful, and he makes them grow. And aren't you more important than these flowers on the side of I-240? Who takes care of you? 
who provides for you, who protects you. Now see, this is a truth that's really hard for us to remember, particularly when we enter into times where things aren't going well. Because all of us, when things start to go sideways for us, we start to get tempted to think that we're all alone, that God has abandoned us, that our friends, that there's no one who understands what we're going through, that we're just gonna suffer in this by ourselves, but nothing could be further from the truth. He says, I I provide, I protect, I am here. He takes it a a step further even in chapter seven. We'll skip ahead to chapter seven with me real quick. Chapter seven, verse seven, he's back to the subject of prayer. And, And listen to what Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and The one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? (laughs) Nobody, right? Your kid asks you for candy, and you're like, here's some gravel. (laughs) Like, no one does that. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. Dad, can I have a sandwich? No, but here's a snake, right? It's like, no one, this is how funny Jesus is. If you then who are evil, uh uh-oh, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? This is, of course, a rhetorical question, right? The answer is no one is gonna do these things. And yet Jesus is setting up these contrasts, right? The bread and the stones, the fish and the serpent. To say, of course, you will give good things to your kids when they ask you. Parents provide for our needs and even for our desires at times because they care about us. And if we know how to bless our children, and he says, even though we are evil, right? Because we are born sinners and our hearts are turned in on ourselves and they're turned away from God. And every single one of us in this room is born a sinner with an evil heart that is selfish. And he says, if you, if even you know how to bless your kids when they ask you for things, how much more does a holy and righteous and perfect and pure God who is your father? He's a good father who loves to provide good things for his kids. And the proof of that is that our father gave his own son for us. It's what Romans 8 says. If God did not spare his own son, but gave him for us, how will he not now with him gladly give us all things? So so remember this, kids, adults, when you are fearful, when you are anxious, when you are worried, when you're thinking, I don't know how I'm gonna get out of this mess, I don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow, and you're filled with worry and anxiety and fear, you can remember that you have a God in heaven who is your father who loves you and provides for you and protects you. Now, does that mean you're gonna be immune from all pain and suffering? No, it doesn't. No. In this same passage in Matthew 7, Jesus says, Build your house on the rock and not on the sand. You remember that? And why? Because he says, when the storms come, not if, but when, if your house is built on the sand, it's gonna get destroyed. But if your house is built on the rock, it's going to weather the storm. It doesn't mean you're immune from the storms, but it means you'll survive them. What makes you anxious? What makes you worried? I know for some of you, it's like everything, (laughs) okay? Um, Okay, what does that say about our trust in our Father who is a provider and a protector? What keeps you up at night? What makes you worried? Can you entrust those things to your Father in heaven who provides for you and who protects you? Now, move with me, if you will, to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. I wanna point out a couple more things that it means for us that God is our Father. You guys still hanging with me? Okay, Hebrews chapter 12. This is an unpopular passage, (laughs) but nevertheless, it is true. And I wanna read it to you really quickly, starting in verse 
5 of Hebrews chapter 12. So if you were in Matthew, that's to the left a good ways. Uh, if you get to like Peter and John and those guys at the end, you went too far, book of James. Uh, if you're in our app, it's just scroll to the next passage. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 says this. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? Then he quotes from the book of Proverbs. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Parents, if you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Okay, what I want you to see in this passage is that our Father not only provides for us and protects us, but our Father instructs us and our Father disciplines us. Our Father instructs us and disciplines us. Now, this is a side of God being our Father that we don't like to think about, that we don't like to talk about, but it should cause us praise. That we have a Father in heaven who loves us enough to discipline us when we go astray. Our father instructs us and he disciplines us. Those, those aren't even fun words, are they? Like instruction and discipline. I mean, I was thinking like all these kids are out of school for the summer. They're like, don't talk to me about instruction and discipline anymore. Like, I just want to have fun, you know? It's the way I feel inside basically all the time. <laughs> but again, the author's quoting from Proverbs. And if you don't know anything about the book of Proverbs, Proverbs is a book of instruction. It's written from the perspective of a father to a son. And it's written about basically um, practical tips on how the world works. So uh, Solomon is the author of most of the book of Proverbs and Solomon was the wisest man that, that ever lived aside from Jesus. And if Solomon is writing instruction to his son, then we ought to take heed and listen, right? Because he knows how the world works. If this isn't just like ideas and philosophies. This is real, you know, black and white, kind of gritty. This is how life is and you should listen. See, one of the main jobs that a parent has is to help our kids learn how to make wise choices so that when they become adults, they can honor God with the decisions that they make, right? That's one of the reasons we do what we do, kids. Our job is to train you up and help you learn how to be wise. God, our Father, also wants us to make wise choices. So he's given us his words. He's given us the scripture. Now, this is important. Um, psalm 119, you, you may be familiar, okay? Psalm 119 is the longest psalm in the whole Bible. It actually falls right in the middle of the Bible, and it's all about the Bible. <laughs> it's all about the word of God. And one of the things that the author of Psalm 119 says is, your word is a lamp, what? Unto my feet and a light unto my path. Your word is instruction to me. It is helpful to me. It's a guide to me to help me make wise choices and honor God in my life. A lot of people think that the Bible is a rule book. And if you're unfamiliar with Christianity or maybe you're new to Christianity, you may think that, that God has given us a list of rules and we're to, you know, read the rules and abide by the rules. And if we do well enough on the test, that God will approve of us or accept us or bless us because we've done what he said. But that's not how it is. The Bible primarily is a story. And primarily that story is not about us, but it's about God and what he has done, who he is and his nature and character and what he has done to save us, to rescue us, to redeem us, to make us his own. That's primarily what the Bible is all about, but there are also instructions in it. And this is what's so beautiful about God as our father. He hasn't left us alone to guess how he wants us to live. 
He's not just sitting up in heaven going, hey, good luck figuring out what I want from you and you better get it right, you know? That's what some of us think, that God is this, you know, sort of old man in the sky just sort of watching us to see if we step on his lawn. But he's a father who loves us and has given us instruction on how to live. You know, you may have heard this statement. It, people say it all the time in the world that we live in because um, we think, you know, we just live a little bit and we make mistakes and we learn from them and, that's, and so we say, well, you know, live and learn. Live and learn. But God says to us, learn and live. Learn and live. Listen to me, listen to my instruction, abide by what I've called you to and you will find life, you will thrive. And because God, like any good parent, cares not only about your current behavior, but about the state of your heart, there's discipline when we disobey. There are consequences for not listening and abiding by God's instructions. Now, let's be honest, okay? Discipline doesn't feel like love in the moment, does it? <laughs> Anybody love discipline? <laughs> really? All right. Good job, Dad. <laughs> discipline, when you, okay, so the big fight in our house is screen time, y'all. I don't know how, when I was a kid, I'm so glad we didn't have internet and stuff, you know? I'm dating myself a little bit, but hallelujah. It's such a battle. It's such a battle. And we're trying to put some parameters that we think are healthy, but I'm not putting my kids on the spot, but every one of them, right, fights against that, right? Because apparently none of their friends have limitations on screen time, and I'm like, who are these parents? But anyway, um, <laughs> It's my self-righteousness, my judginess coming out on these parents. I'm sure they do have limitations. They're just different than ours. And so our big battle is screen time. And when we have to discipline our kids for disobeying or being you know, dishonest or whatever, that we take away the screen time. And that doesn't feel like love in the moment. But our point and our hope in disciplining them is to teach them to respect boundaries and respect authority. Kids, listen to me real quick. What, what if your parents just let you do whatever you wanted, whenever you wanted, without any consequence? How would you feel about that? Yeah, some of you would be like, yes, right? For about a day, maybe a week, some of you real rebellious ones, maybe a month, <laughs> you would think it's awesome. But what if saying to you, if you were allowed to do whatever you wanted, whenever you wanted, without consequence, you know why people would do that? Because they don't care. They don't care what you do. They don't care what you get into. And so you think that having restrictions and limitations and discipline and instruction is, is unloving, but it's actually the most loving thing that can be done for you in the moment. Because we care not only about your behavior, but about your heart and as we said in our dedications, the outcome of your faith. So when we disregard our parents, when we disregard God's instructions in his words, we are disregarding their authority. To disregard my instructions in my home is to disregard my authority as your parent. To disregard God's instructions in our, in our lives is to disregard the authority of our father in heaven, which is the very same sin that our first parents got themselves into. When God gave them clear instructions about eating the fruit and then the serpent tempted them and said, are you really gonna, like, did God really love you? Will you really die if you eat this? And he tempted them and twisted the truth to make them believe a lie. And they disobeyed against, they, they, they disregarded God's gracious authority in their lives. And there's discipline for that. Discipline teaches us to respect boundaries and to respect authority in our lives. And so God instructs us, but he also disciplines us because he loves us. Now, one last passage I want to bring you to, to, to sort of round this thing out. If you, if you have your Bible, flip backwards with me back to the Gospels. We're going to look at Luke 15 really briefly. 
I want to give you the foundation for why God protects us, why God provides for us, why God instructs us, why God disciplines us. Why does he do all of those things for us? Luke chapter 15. I'm going to go ahead and give you the spoiler alert. It's because God loves us. Our Father loves us. That's why he provides, protects, instructs, and disciplines us. So before we get into this section of text I want to read, let me just set the story up for you. You guys are very familiar with this story. It's called the prodigal son. You guys know this one? Okay. Here's what happens. Just to give you a recap if you're unfamiliar. Jesus is teaching a group. He's teaching two groups of people at the same time. He's teaching a group of tax collectors and sinners. Okay. So kind of the worst of the worst in the culture. And he's also at the same time teaching a group of religious people who think that they're better than the sinners. Okay. So in his teaching, he starts to tell this story about a lost sheep. And how the sheep wandered off, but the, but the uh, shepherd left the 99 to go follow the one, and he found it. And then he tells this story about a lost coin. How this person had lost something very valuable, valuable to them in their house, and they basically turned the house upside down in order to find the coin. And he relates those two things to us as, as sinners being found and coming home to God. But then he starts to tell this story about a lost son. And basically what happens is there's this father who has two sons and he's a, he's a wealthy man and his two sons will one day gain an inheritance when he passes. But the younger son is a little rebellious, much like many of us. And he decides, I want my inheritance now, right? It's kind of like that Veruca Assault character from uh, Willy Wonka. I want it now, daddy. And so he, uh, he goes to his father and you have to understand the weight of this, Right? When you say to your dad, who's still living, can I have my inheritance? What you're saying is, could you be dead already? And the father, in hearing this request of his son, graciously gives him his portion of the inheritance. He sacrifices to make this happen. The son, he takes his inheritance, he runs off to the city, and the the scripture would tell us that he squanders it all. He lives it up, man. He does everything that he shouldn't do. He lives recklessly. Some of you call that your 20s. and, and he gets to the bottom. He spends everything. Things go south for him. He loses all of his money. He's broke. He's lonely. He's literally eaten food out of a pig's trough. And he finally comes to the end of his rope and he realizes, what have I done? I've squandered everything. And all of a sudden, this thought occurs to him, maybe, just maybe... If I go to my dad and I tell him, man, I've blown it really, really badly, maybe, I know I I can't be accepted into the family. In this culture, to do what he did and then to come back would be like, he would probably be killed. Like he would not be accepted as a son again. He knew that. And so he says, maybe if I tell my dad I'm sorry, maybe if I apologize, then maybe he'll ask me back and I can just be a servant, like a hired hand. I can be an employee of my family business, but I know I'll never be a son again. So he rehearses this, you know, sort of I'm sorry speech. This is what I'm going to say. This is how it's going to go. And finally he decides, I just got to do it. And so he makes the long journey home to see his father. And here's where we pick up in this story. Verse 20 of Luke 15. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. See, he's starting to rehearse that speech. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe. So he's going, shh, shh, shh. He's shushing his son. Okay, none of that right now. Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand. That's the signet ring. That's the the symbol, the family crest. Put that ring on his finger. Put shoes on his feet. You know you've lived it up when you come home without any shoes, okay? Just to say. (laughs) And bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead. And now is alive. He was lost and now he is found. And they began to celebrate. You see the beauty of this? Jesus tells this story to illustrate for us what the love of God the Father for us is like. This kid is coming back home 
knowing there's no way he could ever be accepted back in the family again. He just wants to be an employee in the household. Some of you know what that feels like. Some of you've been there to that bottom or you've run so far, you know, you feel like God would never accept you back. But this father's been waiting. And he sees the son in the distance and he takes off running. Now, if you're the son, okay, and you know what you've done and now you're coming back and you see the father running towards you, what are you thinking? He's gonna murder me. Like, that's what you're thinking. Oh no, he's running at me. But as soon as his father gets to him, he embraces him. In fact, the text, if you look in the original language, it says that he, he, um, he hugged him and kissed him and kept on kissing him. <laughs> like he just couldn't stop being affectionate with his boy. He won't hear anything of his son's you know, plan or his speech or any of that because he says there's no earning your way back into this family. He puts the best robe, which is the father's robe. He puts that mark of the family on his finger. He puts the shoes on his feet, which were a symbol of wealth, the wealth of the family. He says, restore my son, clean him up, dress him up and give him what he lost. We're gonna have a party. And Jesus tells that story to say, this is it, y'all. Like this is the picture of the father's love for foolish rebels like you and me. This is the father's heart for his children. This is how much God the father loves you and me. And we read this story and we go, okay, but how can we be sure of that? Like, how can we be sure that this is how much God the father loves us? And I'll tell you how. If you'll read the gospels, you'll see that there's only one time in all the gospel accounts that Jesus does not refer to God as his father. You know when that is? It's on the cross. It's on the cross. Jesus, from the cross, cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You see, God loved us so much that he sent Jesus to live a life that you and I could never live and then to die in our place for our sins. And when Jesus was on the cross, The only time he didn't refer to God as father is when he was suffocating and dying and he was in a sense forsaken by the father and he endured the shame of the cross, the scorn of it, the wrath of God in our place on the cross being treated as God's enemy so that you and I could hear from the father, this is my child in whom I am well pleased. This is my child in whom I'm well pleased. You understand that? Like when, when Christ stood in our place and took the punishment for our sin and rebellion, for our desire to be our own authority and all of that stuff, when the gavel nail, you know, kind of nailed down that it is finished and it's paid for, not only were we declared not guilty, but then God the judge got off of the bench took off his judicial robe, came around and embraced you and me, put his arms around us and said, welcome home, my child. Some of you have a hard time believing that. You know you might be forgiven, but you don't think that you're loved. You understand that God doesn't hold your sin against you, but you think his disposition towards you is disappointment, disgust, you know, kind of like, hey, just stand in the corner and don't touch anything. but it's not true. He loves you. He loves me. We have the right to be called the children of God. First John chapters three and four are all about that. And in those chapters, uh, the author of first John will say, see how much the father has loved us. So we are called the children of God. And so we are that he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Meaning that that word is a big Bible word, which just means that he absorbed the wrath of God towards us and he turned it into God's favor towards us. That's what propitiation means. That Jesus stood in our place. And it's only when it, listen, it's only when you and I start to see how much we are loved by God that we will be free to trust in his provision, to trust in his protection, to heed his instruction and to endure his discipline. 
you, that penny has to drop for you. You have to understand how much you are loved by God. How much are you loved by God? That he sent Jesus to die for you. To live the life you could never live. To die in your place for your sins and to rise again from the grave so that you could be forgiven and adopted into his family. And it's only when you start to see how much you are loved that you will actually be free to trust him and to obey him. It's not a trust and obey and then you're accepted. It's a you're accepted because of Jesus, now trust and obey. Okay, I don't have questions like I normally have. All I wanna do as we start to respond to the Lord is, is have you think on this. In your everyday life, are you relating to God like he's your dad? Or do you see God in another way? Like I talked last week about a grumpy HR manager, right? Or like an old man, you know, who doesn't want you to walk on the lawn. Like how do you view God? What, is your, what, is, what are you projecting on God that you think he's like? And what could change if you actually started to view God rightly as a father who loves you, provides for you, protects you, instructs you, and yeah, disciplines you. What could change in the way that you relate to God if you saw him as a father who loves you first and does all those things because he loves you? So I want you to think on that question. I'm gonna pray for you. Now, it's a full...